we lost the internet. So that's the first time we lost the internet. So let's see. Let's see if this works. So we're we're reading now. We're reading from the third canto. We're reading from the thirtieth chapter, text six. It just got cut off, and now we're coming back. I'm gonna try this again. I'm running off my data card somehow. It was the first time that ever happened that we got cut off. Yeah, time to return. Okay, we're gonna give you. There are like 50 of you, give you time to return. And I hope this works. And um, I just bought a device to bring stronger internet into my office, so I'm not sure why we got cut off. And now we're running on data, so that's also kind of tricky, maybe. So let's see. So I'll just read the purport again. Um, and waiting for you all to come back, we'll just review the purport. The so-called perfection of human life is a concoction. Therefore, it is said that the materialist, however materially qualified he may be, is worthless because he is hovering on the mental plane, which will drag him again to the material existence of temporary life. How successful can you be if you die and take another birth? That's the point. One who acts on the mental plane cannot get promotion to the spiritual. Such a person is always sure to glide down again to material life. In the association of so-called society, friendship, and love, the conditioned soul appears completely satisfied. So Prabhupada's making a very simple point, which he makes over and over again, which, which I think for Many people, is, it's hard to initially get into their head because they've, they've never thought like this before. And it's such a simple point. And it's foundational to our preaching and our philosophy. If you're very successful materially, even if you so-called are happy and your life is peaceful and wonderful, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and in your next life you become a dog, that means this life was a total failure. That's Prabhupada's point. So, you know, Prabhupada's talking about the materialist as failing, as life being unsuccessful. And then you look at their life, and from the material perspective, many people are very successful, very happy, nice home, nice family, nice job, nice this, nice that. And Prabhupada's saying, it's a failure. And so what does he mean? You're next, you're coming back, taking another birth. You failed. You failed in this life because this life was meant for going back to Godhead. So despite everything you have, that's the message. We know that message. That's Prabhupada's message. That's Shastra's message. So let's go to text seven. So Kamaniya, you can bring up text seven. And we've got most of you back, not all of you. We're still missing about 10 of you. We're still waiting for you. And hopefully this connection will be okay. So I'll read the Sanskrit, and that will give a little time to put up the verse. That's up now. And wait for the others. Sandayamana Sarvanga Eshamun van hanadina Korocha virutam murho Duritani durashayaha Although he is always burning with anxiety, such a fool always performs all kinds of mischievous activities with a hope which is never to be fulfilled fulfilled in order to maintain his so-called family and society. So there's the key with a hope which is never to be fulfilled. So for a materialistic person, whatever their hope is, it won't be fulfilled. Or you might say, but it seems like people fulfill some of their dreams. Yeah, but they have, it's never fulfilled exactly. There's always someone better than them. There's always another dream 
you know, I was just watching a video last night, and it was a coaching video, how to train coaches. I, guess. Um, I was listening, and one of the things coaches ask is, what's your dream? You know, if you had all the money in the world, all the time in the world, what would you do? If you could do anything and not fail, what would you what would you do? What is, you know, what is that magical thing? What is it? What, you know, that's how coaches coach people. They want to get them to dream about <laughs> what do you want to do. And this verse is saying, with a hope which is never to be fulfilled. It, it's never going to be perfect. And even if it is, it comes, you know, it comes out. So, you know, all the coaches are saying, build your sandcastle. What's, what's the sandcastle you want to build? I'll help you build the sandcastle. They're not saying, why don't you build something upon which you can step on the head of death? That's transcendental coaching. That's what we do. Purport. It is said that it is easier to maintain a great empire than to maintain a small family. Especially in these days when the influence of Kali Yuga is so strong that everyone is, is harassed and full of anxieties because of accepting the false presentation of Maya's family. The family we maintain is created by Maya. It is the perverted reflection of the family in Krishna Loka. In Krishna Loka, there are also family, friends, society, father and mother. Everything is there, but they are eternal. So the key, this is the key. And I know this sounds simplistic, and I know when I read these things, you're thinking, well, yeah, I know all this. But I think one thing we don't really know, I mean, we know it in our head, but we don't really know it well, is that this world is a perverted reflection. So what does a perverted reflection mean? Is that this is not your family. Your real family is there, not here. And we think, how attached are we to our family? We think this is all real. This is all we know. And Prabhupada's saying, perverted. It's, it's just a reflection of reality. And it's hard to see this as a reflection, isn't it? We tend to see this as the reality. And we're so foolish, we kind of, in our conditioned state, look at the spiritual world and think that's almost like a reflection of reality, like this is real and that's like not real. Isn't it? You hear about the spiritual world as transcendental. It sounds sometimes like fairy tales. And so we may be thinking, that sounds so unreal. And this here is real. I can touch this. I can talk to my husband. I can talk to my wife. I can see them. It's real. I get in my car. I drive it. This is real. I can taste it, smell it, hear it, touch it. And up there, the spiritual world and what's going on, it seems like it's just, seems like some mythology, fairy tale, something, something. It's so unreal. I can't even imagine what it's like. That's the problem. The problem is this is unreal and that's real. This is the fairy tale and that's real. This is the perverted reflection and that's real. And in conditioned life, we tend to get it backwards. Here, continue reading the purport, 337, 337. Here, as we change bodies, our family relationships also change. Sometimes we are in a family of human beings, sometimes in a family of demigods, sometimes in a family of cats, or sometimes a family of dogs. Hare Krishna. Family, society, and friendship are flickering, and so they are called a sat. It is said that as long as we are attached to this asat, temporary, non-existing society and family, we are always full of anxieties. The materialists do not know that the family, society, and friendship here in the material world are only shadows, and thus they become attached. Naturally, their hearts are always burning. But in spite of all inconvenience, they still work to maintain such false families because they have no information of the real family association of Krishna. So this, 
this verse enables us or enables us to explain and all of us to see why someone at the end of their life would renounce because they're renouncing something that they needed but they're renouncing something that they realize is not eternal it's not real it's 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 based on some falsity and they want reality so renunciation is part of the process as you get older you renounce what are you renouncing you might say you're renouncing something externally, but really you're renouncing the illusion. You're not renouncing uh, your husband, wife necessarily, your, your relationships with any relatives. You're renouncing the illusion that these are real relationships. And when you renounce that illusion, then naturally there's detachment. You know, even within the relationship, that illusion is supposed to be renounced gradually, just like you have the example of Priyavrata Maharaj. Priyavrata Maharaj was asked to be king, but he didn't want to marry. So he just wanted to live his life doing austerity, but there was no one else to be king. And he was refusing, refusing, refusing. And so Lord Brahma had to come and ask him. And he would accept Lord Brahma's request, and everyone knew he would accept it. So they asked Lord Brahma, you, you have to come down and ask him. So when Lord Brahma came down, he said, okay, I'll do it. Now, he didn't want to get married, but to be king, he had to get married. So he had no desire for a wife, and he had no desire for children. But if you saw him, it didn't show at all. It seemed like he was a good husband and a good father, not naturally attached to his wife and children. But as explained in that part of the Bhagavatam, he wasn't. He just didn't have that attachment. He was beyond that. It wasn't his nature. But externally, it looked like he was attached. So real attachment is internal, not external. So we may engage with so many things in this world. But like Priyavrata Maharaj, we don't get too attached. So we are supposed to, as we advance, we're supposed to become more renounced, and it may not in any way show up externally. It may externally, it may just look the same for Priyarata. It looked, it just looked like he was like any other king. You have the story of um, Pundarik Vidyaniti and Gadadhar Pandit, and when Gadadhar Pandit met Pundarik Vidyaniti, Pundarik Vidyaniti was and. He was dressed extravagantly, and he appeared to be a very worldly person. And then, Gadadhar Pandit quoted a verse about how merciful, there's a verse, you may know this verse, that Krishna is so merciful that he gave Putana the position of mother. And so, who else should I worship than Krishna because he's so merciful? And when Pandarik Vidyaniti heard that verse, he fell off his bed and was like, he's so merciful, Krishna's so merciful, like that. He was experiencing ecstasy hearing that verse, which is obviously a sign of a very advanced devotee, that when he hears Bhagavatam, he exhibits one of the eight ecstatic symptoms. And when Gadadhar Pandit saw this, he understood that he had miscalculated the renunciation of Pundarik Vidyaniti. And then he accepted him as his guru. So renunciation doesn't always doesn't always manifest externally. And as you advance, it should at least manifest internally more and more. Um, yes. Okay. So let's go on to verse nine. We're doing good. No, excuse me. Verse 8, yeah, we just read 7. Okay, verse 8. Kamini has it up. Akshiptat matendriya shrinam vasatinam cha mayaya raho rachitaya la pai sushinam kala bashinam. He gives his heart and senses to a woman. Who falsely charms him with Maya. He enjoys solitary embraces and talking with her. And he is enchanted 
by the sweet words of the small children. So, um, um, Kama Gayatri says she's not lucky in her relationships with family. Maybe you can see that as a great fortune. Maybe, maybe Krishna was afraid you'd become too attached to a husband and family, so it, uh, you're, it never happened. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let it happen, so you're naturally in an ideal position now to be Krishna conscious. You know, for us, so many times we see that bad things are actually good. And, and sometimes things don't work out, and then we think, you know, if it worked out, I would probably be worse off spiritually. Better off materially, but probably worse off spiritually. So sometimes it's good that it didn't work out. Sometimes Krishna saved us, and sometimes we see that. Even though we wanted to work materially, we see that actually it was better, it didn't. Better for my spiritual life. You know, what if, what if I sent all of you a million dollars and you, I PayPal'd it and you all got it tomorrow? So, you know, now imagine what would you do with that? How would your life change? For some of you, I think you would do amazing and do much more service. And, and I think some of you, it would be a real obstacle. You would be preoccupied in finding a house, buying a new car, getting this, buying that, you know, you, and it, it would, it could be very unhealthy. So sometimes Krishna doesn't let us get everything we want. And if we're honest, we may look at that and say, well, maybe that means I couldn't use it and Krishna didn't give it, or it would have been bad for me. So like that. So let me read that verse again, and I'll read it in a very special way. He gives his heart and senses to a woman who falsely charms him with Maya. He enjoys solitary embraces and talking with her, and he is enchanted by the sweet words of small children. So this is, this is to describe how an ordinary man becomes, actually what, what's going on here, I, I have to, I have to explain what's going on here. This part of the Bhagavatam is going to show how an ordinary man, when he dies, dies thinking of his family, thinking how will they be maintained in my absence, I will miss them, and so forth. So these verses are just explaining the process that he goes through in conditioned life, which then causes him to die in this consciousness. And we we were discussing before how whatever you are attached to, that's what you think of at death. So now Bhagavatam here is showing this philosophy in the example of ordinary people. So this is very, very common. What's and how Maya comes and creates attachments, and those attachments become stronger and stronger. And the basis of all material attachment is family. These are the things we're most strongly attached to. So in Kama Gayatri's case, not so attached because her family life wasn't so pleasing. In fact, in many ways, detached. She's very detached. The problem that Kama Gayatri could have, or anyone, I'm not saying she would have, but anyone in her position, is because it was so difficult, you want to do it again, and find some happiness. So that's that's always the challenge of something not working out well, which could detach you and give you the the knowledge that okay, this is not where I find my happiness. It could work out that oh, I was never happy with this. I want to do it again. So that's also there. That's also a potential problem. Anyway, let's read the purport. Family life within the kingdom of illusory energy, Maya, is just like a prison for the eternal living entity. In prison, a prisoner is shackled by iron chains and iron bars. Similarly, a conditioned soul is shackled by the charming beauty of a woman 
by her solitary embraces and her talks of so-called love and by the sweet words of his small children. Thus he forgets his real identity. So what Prabhupada's saying in relation to the previous verses is that this is how Maya sets up a person or sets up every conditioned soul to forget him by, in, by putting objects that are so attractive and endearing, which is the husband, wife, and the children, and so forth. So much so that all of one's attachment goes there, and then one feels himself happy in Maya. And if I'm happy in Maya, I certainly don't need Krishna. That's, that's the trap. Happy in Maya, I don't need Krishna. Rafael, you will feel hunger and pain in a ghost body, and you won't have any body to eat with, so you'll go completely crazy. So don't do it. In this verse, the words strinam asatinam indicate that womanly love is just to agitate the mind of man. Actually, in the material world, there is no love. Both the woman, now you might say, but my husband is affectionate to me, or my wife is affectionate to me, or my children are affectionate to me. Yeah. Devotees know how to manifest real affection because the the if we help one another come closer to Krishna, that's real affection. But what Prabhupada means is so often love is guised. Lust is guised in the name of love. And when they, I love you. What do you love about me? Well, I love what you give to me. Yeah. I love the way you, there was a song, I love the way you walk, I love the way you talk. Something like that. So that's Prabhupada's point, that it's not love. I, you know, I love the way you walk and the way you talk. Well, will you love the way I walk and talk in 50 years? Maybe, maybe not. I won't walk and talk the same way. So that's Prabhupada's point. It's lust. I like what you do. I like the way you make me feel. And I call that love, but I really don't love you. And sometimes that's hard to accept. But I think nowadays it's, it's kind of easy to see with all the divorce that it never was love. It was really very personally motivated. So that's Prabhupada's point. It looks like love, but where there's personal motivation, then when the person's no longer satisfied, then they give up their relationship. So let's read what Prabhupada says. And I know this is kind of heavy, and we have to understand it contextually, and I'll try to explain it more. Both the woman and the man are interested in their sense gratification. For sense gratification, a woman creates an illusory love and the man becomes enchanted by such false love and forgets his real duty. Real duty means Krishna consciousness. When there are children, as the result of such a combination, the next attraction is to the sweet words of the children. The love of the woman at home and the talk of the children make one a secure prisoner. Prabhupada is transcendentally sarcastic. And thus he cannot leave his home. You are a secure prisoner in your home, gentlemen, and the locks are the shackles of the so-called affection of wife and children. Right? It's, I don't even want to say so-called. The, the, there is a lot of affection, obviously, but um, it, whether you call it real or false, it doesn't even matter in the context Prabhupada's talking because he's saying that's the affection the affection is like the locks on the prison. You are a secure prisoner, secured by the locks of affection. Hmm. So, Parm is asking, is it possible to have real love? Yeah, if, you, if you're dedicated to Guru and Krishna, and you're dedicated to helping your wife become Krishna conscious, and she's dedicated to helping you become Krishna conscious, that is real love. That is what it means. 
Aside from that, to, to the degree we're conditioned, to that degree our love will be contaminated. But one of the things that I think, is just as a side point, what I think of love in, in, in marriage, the first thing that comes to my mind more than the romantic idea of love is the duty, the idea of duty that, you know, if my wife's sick, I'll undergo austerities to see that I, that she's taken care of. That, that is what I would call real love. Even from the material perspective, when you sacrifice for the other person, that's real love. But, but Prabhupada's saying, you know, there, there's so much materially you get from a husband and wife, and that's where it's not real. But I think what we, what we need to stress and think about is the, you know, if you are dedicated to your husband, dedicated to your wife, dedicated to taking care of your children, that is, the, that is what love is. That is how we see love in, in a marriage situation. And then you might say there, there are many people who are dedicated to their wives, dedicated to their husbands, and it's true. And Prabhupada even said in, in seeing a husband and wife who were dedicated to one another, he said they, they have love. Um, most of the times, wife needs more affection. What to do for the please or for that? Ask her what she needs. <laughs> Don't ask me, ask her. Hare Krishna. Yeah, that's the best answer I can give. Um, so, so for us, manifest affection in, in terms of, you know, you, you, you're dedicated to your role as a husband and wife, father and mother. That's love. You know, like my parents never divorced. They took care of me. So you might say, well, did they have love, didn't they? And you would say, you know, from the from a general perspective, you would say, yes, they love me. Or like Radha Priya will say, her grandmother loves her. She's the best grandmother and took care of her and like that. Yeah, so they do. When Prabhupada says there's no love, specifically he's, he's really talking about male-female, the contamination of lust in that relationship and how lust is seen as love. And I think that's easy for us to understand. Let's continue reading. The love of the woman at home and the talk of the children make one a secure prisoner, and thus he cannot leave his home. Such a person is termed in Vedic language a griha medhi. Medhi means the center, and griha means the home, which means one whose center of attraction is home. Grihasta refers to one who lives with family, wife, and children, but whose real purpose of living is to develop Krishna consciousness. One is therefore advised to become a grihasta, not a grihamedhi. The grihasta's concern is to get out of the family life created by illusion and enter into the real family life with Krishna, where the grihamedhi's business is to repeatedly chain himself to so-called family life. In one life after another and perpetually remain in the darkness of Maya. So, you know, it's not like Prabhupada here is, you know, when he says there's no love, he's he's speaking philosophically. When when you look at practically, you might say, you know, my father really loved my mother, or I really love my wife, or I really love my husband. And and I wouldn't I wouldn't really want to debate that in in within a certain context. Yes. There is love. There's affection. It's very strong. But Prabhupada's point is when so-called love and affection overtakes our love and affection for Krishna, then that so-called love and affection is actually poisonous, contaminating. You say, oh, uh, and you might say, yeah, but it says in Shastra that when a woman dies thinking of her husband, then she takes birth as a man in her next life, and that it'll probably be easier to become a, a Krishna conscious as a man. But if you ask men nowadays in Kali Yuga, I, I don't know if all men will agree that it's easier being a man. It's hard being a man in Kali Yuga. And, and the goal is not to, to you know, die thinking of your husband and become a man. The goal is to go back to Krishna. So when you put every, you know, see, you see what Prabhupada is doing is he puts everything in the context of 
here's the standard, go back to Godhead. Now we judge everything against that standard. And that's why everything looks bad against that standard. So even though some Prabhupada talks about things and we're thinking, why is he saying that's bad or what's wrong with that? It seems good. You know, there's so much divorce, it seems good if the husband's attached to the wife. You know, there's so many lazy men that don't work and Prabhupada's saying, oh, these people work like asses. Well, it seems better to work like an ass than sit around and do nothing. You know, so we look at it that way and it seems like, you know, in a sense what Prabhupada's saying is that the good things are bad and we look at look at them and say, but well, that's good. In the age of Kali, men are, are so unchaste. It'd be, be good if they're attached to their wife and they're so lazy. It'd be good if they worked harder. And so we have to understand specific context and the specific, specific points Prabhupada is making. Because relatively, if you relativize the statement, yeah, it, it could mean something else. So you have to put it, you understand it within the context that Prabhupada's explaining it. And outside that context, then you can adjust your understanding. Yeah, there are good husbands, there are good wives, there is, we do see affection, my mother loved me, this and that. But within, within that relativistic nature, we can adjust. But within the absolute nature, Prabhupada's putting in the context, so what is the value of this relationship if at the end you're attached and then you die thinking of this person? You might say, well, the person's a devotee. Okay, for us, it's a little different. I'll die thinking of my husband and wife who is a devotee. And if I think of devotee, I think of Krishna. Okay if you think of them without material attachment. Yeah, okay. If you think of them with material attachment, it may not work the way you think it would work. So you understand the context. We're going to evaluate the success of something, the value of something, based on how Krishna consciousness makes you, based on how it will get you out of the material, material world. And if we look at that context, then we can see why Prabhupada is smash, smash, smashing, smashing things which sometimes we think are not so bad in and of themselves. Isn't it an interesting point? I was, I was thinking about this a few years ago because some people were telling me that there's a lot of men, especially older devotees, but they just don't want to work. And their wives are working and they're kind of hanging out all day just reading and chanting, which, you know, from, from one perspective sounds like well, that sounds good, you know, that's what we should be doing. And if their wife can make the money and they can absorb themselves in hearing and chanting, why not? But from their wife's perspective, it's just these men are being lazy. They're not doing anything and I don't want to be working so hard and providing while my husband does nothing to earn money. So from that perspective, then, yes, he's being lazy. And then we hear about the mudhas, you know, the beast of burden. They work so hard, 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 hard. And then that woman thinks, I wish my husband were a mudha, because right now he's lazy. So, you know, relatively speaking, in those contexts, we might say, well, better be a mudha than, than lazy, because lazy is more tamasic, and mudha is more passionate, rajasic. So rajas is higher than tamas. So better be in rajas. So... We can understand things in that way, but in the absolute context that Prabhupada is putting everything in, then we have to understand it that way. Yeah, the beast of burden works like a, an ass and then he um, wastes his life. That's the context. But in the relative context, maybe it's good someone works like an ass. Otherwise, they'll just sleep all day and watch TV. So, so you understand what I'm saying. So when Prabhupada's making these points, and some of these points are like, whoa, that's very heavy. He's looking at it in terms of what's the conclusion. What's the conclusion of this thinking? And that's the context of this chapter. So let's go to text 9. Canto 3, chapter 30, text 9. And if you go up... One, two, you'll see Kamini has put the verse there. Kriheshu kuta dharmeshu dukha tantresh vatan drittaha kurvan dhuka pratikharam sukavan manyate grihi. The attached householder. 
remains in his family life, which is full of diplomacy, politics, and constantly spreading miseries. Restricted in his acts of sense gratification, he acts just to counteract his miseries, and if he can successfully counteract such miseries, he thinks that he is happy. Now, you may think, wait a minute, not all family life is like this, and it's true, not exactly like this. You might say, this is a broad generalization, and you know, my parents had a great marriage and so forth, and I don't deny it. This is a generalization, but this depicts what happens in many families. This also depicts, to some degree, what may happen in all families, to a little bit here, you know, of all these things. Um, so these obviously are gener generalizations. And also another thing is, if you're looking at this from a spiritual perspective, then anything that takes you away from Krishna is misery. And so it may not, within its own context, seem like misery. Like we went out today, we had a great time with the family. But that was, you know, eight hours with the family of forgetting Krishna. So that's also unfortunate. It also is miserable and so forth. So it, it has that context also. So let's read it and try to, to um, understand it better. In the Bhagavad Gita, the personality of Godhead himself certifies the material world as an impermanent place that is full of miseries. There is no question of happiness in this material world, either individually or in terms of society, family, society, or country. So... This is another bewildering statement. And the Prabhupada says there's no question of happiness. And then you go to the Gita and Krishna says there's happiness in ignorance, passion, and goodness. So Prabhupada happiness, Krishna's saying there's happiness in three months to be a contradiction. So when Prabhupada says there's no happiness, the verse previous that he quotes is Abrahma Bhuvanalo the material world's a place of misery, because there's birth and death. So within this framework of birth and death, as we're saying, one may feel happy or think they're happy or have a good life. But within that framework, because there's birth and death, old age and disease, then it's actually miserable. But even beyond that misery, even if you say, I can deal with old age and, and disease and death, it's okay. I, I have a, a nice life otherwise. Prabhupada's looking at it in relation to Ananda. So if you compare happiness in this world to Ananda, then you can say that Ananda is miserable. It's like the pig eating stool. He's happy, but from our perspective, that's not happiness. So a lot of times when Prabhupada's saying there's no happiness or there's no this or that, you might read it and say, well, that, that seems to be only for some people, seems to be a broad generalization um, or I just don't understand this exactly. So then you have to put it in the context of what he's actually presenting as happiness. This is happiness. You know, it's like, it's like, let's give an example. Like, okay, I'll give an example. Right here I have a microphone. It's called a Boya, right? This microphone costs under $20. It's, you plug it into your phone or camera. And it's got a long cable. And it sounds like I'm doing an ad. Well, if you're doing any kind of broadcasting and you don't have money, you should get one of these, right? Because it'll. I'm not talking in my phone directly. I have another mic right here. Let's see. Here it is. So when you do that, you get better sound. And so I say, okay, get this mic. I show it to you. Okay. I think I paid $17 for it. I could go in my studio and bring out the microphone I use to make my videos. It costs $269. This is 17 This is not really a microphone. This is usable. You can get by, but it's, it's basically a toy compared to the mic I have. So I'm giving this example and saying, this is, hap this is happiness. 
But I go get my mic out and I bring it up and you hear the difference and you go, yeah, this is not really that great. If you hear this mic by itself, you think, oh, it sounds good. If I bring that other mic out and you hear that, then you realize this mic does not sound good. You won't know it doesn't sound good until you hear the other mic, you hear the other mic and go, wow, that sounds amazing. Then you realize, yeah, this costs $20 and it sounds like $20. It's not professional. It's just something uh, somebody can do a Facebook or a Zoom cast and it's better than the speaker on the phone. So this is compared to happiness. And the other mic, which we don't have, represented by my hand, is compared to spiritual happiness. So in relation to this, this doesn't sound good. This in relation to the phone sounds good. So in relation to ordinary material life, go out with your friends, have a good time, that's happiness. But in relation to Ananda, this doesn't rate. It's not it's nothing. Does that make sense? So so when you read Prabhupada saying there's no happiness, or this, that, no love, this and that, he's comparing it to love of Krishna that the gopis have. So he's saying, well, there's no love here. There's no love here. Okay. There's no love here. This is where there's love. There's no happiness here. This is where there's happiness. Because he's comparing it to the actual standard. But we will experience love and happiness here. But once you get this, then you realize, okay, this is not it. So we, if we read in that context, then it makes sense. Otherwise, we're like, why is Prabhupada saying that? That seems unfair. That's not always true, etc. All right? So let's continue reading. Here in this material world, happiness means successful counteraction to the effects of distress. The material world, so okay, this is a point Prabhupada makes. If I can counteract the distress, I call that happiness. If there's misery and I can get free from the misery, it doesn't mean I'm happy. It just means there's no misery. But when there's no misery, that becomes happiness. Just like if I, um, am I hitting you? When I stop hitting you, you say, okay, I feel good. <laughs> You know, you bang your toe, and a few days later, the pain goes away. I say, how does your toe feel? You say, oh, it feels good. It doesn't feel good. It's just the pain's gone away. But relative to the pain, you say it feels good. It doesn't feel anything. So Prabhupada's saying, if I can successfully re remove misery, that's called happiness. That has nothing to do with happiness. It's nothing to do with ananda. It's just that I remove the pain. So that's another example of, of why Prabhupada's saying there's no happiness. We're experiencing it as happiness because, you know, it's Friday night and I can go out and there's no more work. So I call that happiness and I can get drunk and forget everything and I call that happiness. And all Prabhupada's saying is you've successfully forgotten your misery and you've translated that as happiness. That has nothing to do with ananda, the bliss of you as a spiritual being. So that's the point. Hmm. The material world is so made that unless one becomes a clever diplomat, his life will be a failure. Not to speak of human society, even the society of lower animals, the birds and bees, cleverly manages its bodily demands of eating, sleeping, and mating. Human society competes nationally or individually. And in the attempt to be successful, the entire human society becomes full of diplomacy. We should always remember that in spite of all diplomacy and all intelligence and the struggle for our existence, everything will end in a second by the supreme will. Therefore, all our attempts to become happy in this material world are simply a delusion offered by Maya. So the, the last point Prabhupada makes, and, and often Prabhupada makes the point, you know, okay, you think you're happy, all right, you, everything's nice. But sometimes he would say, okay, we won't even argue that. But he makes the point. Uh, everything will end in a second by the Supreme Will. Okay, okay, everything's nice. We've got enough money. Kids are good. Wife's good. Health is good. You know, 
vacations are good, food is good, car is good, weather is good, everything is good. Life is good. Yeah, and in a second it can end. So that's Prabhupada's point. Hello, hello, hello. Anybody listening? Anybody awake? Hello, hello, hello. No, 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 everything is good. Money, money in the bank. Well, hello, hello. One coronavirus, stock market crash. One coronavirus, how many people have died in the last month? Are you watching? Are you seeing? Are you awake? Are your eyes open? What's wrong with you? That's Prabhupada's point. So when he says there's no happiness, we're thinking, wait a minute. I see so many happy people and I'm happy. And no, but you're in the prison house. Hello, you're in the prison house. This is, you know, birth, old age, disease, and death. Those are the chains. Those are the bars. That's Prabhupada's point. So, I will go down and see. Uh, if there's anything I should read that you said. Kirtisan, did I read somewhere we can get realization through hard work, even if it's mundane? Uh, yeah, you'll get realization that you're working hard, <laughs> that you should work hard, that <laughs> you should be Krishna conscious. And if you do your duty, you'll get purified. Yeah, hard work, but not so hard. Rajra says, happiness is chapala. It comes and goes. Raj Ras, are you in New Vrindavan? Where did you take it? You somehow came here, right? You got out of India just in time. Huh? Mm. Mm. The link is above. Well, I don't think there's a link, but you could read the code above. Um, the noises are probably from bad connection. Oh, you're in Delaware. Whoa. Oh, wow. wow. Amazing. Okay, so... I think we should end now and we'll begin oh tomorrow okay so here's what's happening i was requested by devotees in russia russia is total shutdown so i don't think anybody's working i don't know how the country runs nobody but most people aren't working so they said can you do a class every week any and it turns out that 8 a.m. is the best time for them. So we're going to do a class with them tomorrow, and they want to do a class on how to balance Grihasta life. But it's not, it won't just be about balancing Grihasta life. It'll just be on the topic of balance, balancing life in general. And there's so many things you can balance, attachment, detachment, sense gratification, renunciation, time spent working, time spent in sadhana, time spent with family, how to spend it, what to do with it. So it's going to be an interesting, interesting and relevant class. So what we're trying to do, and I know we can do this, is get the broadcast on Facebook through Zoom because it's going to be on Zoom. They want it on Zoom. Uh, the advantage of Zoom is that I can see you and you can speak. But if you don't want to watch it on Zoom, then there is a way to send it to Facebook. Although I may not see the chat on Facebook because I'll be on Zoom. I would have to bring Facebook up on my computer and then see the chat there. So that maybe I can do that. But um, we're going to work on that so that you can see it on Facebook. But we're going to send you the link for Zoom. So it's tomorrow at 8 o'clock, and if, you know, around 8.05, you don't see me on Facebook, it means we weren't able to do it. We messed, we messed it up somehow, really, and we couldn't get it on Facebook. But, but I did a class last week where we 
or on Facebook when I'm asking that devotee to guide us how to do that. So it should be possible. But we will send you the link for Zoom. If you prefer, you can go on Zoom. And um, obviously, because it's in Russian, I, I don't speak Russian. The class from my side's in English. So anytime you ever see me advertise a class, we're going to do a class next week on Wednesday in Chinese. So probably every Wednesday Chinese, every Thursday Russian. So you just have to see how well you can tolerate the translation. But the Russian translator is one of the best translators. And of course, it doesn't matter if you don't speak Russian, but we're going to. So tomorrow the class will be at the same time, but there's going to be a Russian, Russian translation. And then uh, we'll get back to the text that we're reading. We'll get back to that Thursday on, on Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Then Wednesday, same time. I think Wednesday, it'll, I'll let you know, it'll be an hour earlier in Chinese. So we'll see how that goes. If that doesn't go well, we could end the Chinese class at 8.30, which is a half hour later than we normally start, and then we could do this class. But um, if you like the Chinese class, then it would be easier for me. Oh, the translation gives us time to digest and take notes. Um, also, how to learn to speak Russian as well. So. Okay, so let, so we'll try that tomorrow, and whatever goes on every Wednesday Spanish. I don't know. We didn't we didn't discuss that. So we have to discuss that. You discuss you discuss it. Um, yeah, we have to discuss Spanish. That's another thing. So. Okay. We'll work on Spanish also. Probably on the weekends we can do that. Okay, so Hare Krishna to all of you. And um, we will see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Hopefully on Facebook, but if not, then the link will be posted. I think it may have already been sent out uh, to you if you're on the online mailing list. If you're not on the on my mailing list, we'll, we'll ask Radha Priya post it again, like right after class, if you can post it again, the link for Zoom. So at least you have the Zoom link and you don't have to have Zoom. All you have to do is follow the link and it'll take you. You don't have to have it installed on your phone. And we'll see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Prabhupada Premanandi Hari Hari Bo.